So in the previous lecture, we talked about the anatomy and physiology of the middle ear system. We talked about how the middle ear structures are responsible for conducting the pressure deflections caused by sound on the tympanic membrane to the inner ear and how the middle ear plays an important role uh, in compensating for this impedance mismatch and the loss of energy as sound travels from an air medium into the liquid medium in the inner ear. Okay. An important test that we use to assess the middle ear is this uh, tympanometry. Tympanometry along with acoustical reflexes is um, it's considered as an objective test of hearing. The traditional test that we use to assess the middle ear uh, and to test the, to assess hearing, uh, such as pure tone audiometry and speech audiometry, are considered subjective tests because they require the active participation of the patient um, by requiring them to raise a hand or press a button when they hear tones or repeat words or sentences for us in speech audiometry. On the other hand, tympanometry um, requires minimal participation from the active participation from the patient and it's considered a non-invasive procedure because it's uh, create it has less discomfort it creates less discomfort for the patient while you're doing this assessment. Other objective tests that we're going to be talking about later in the semester include the auditory brainstem response uh, and the autoacoustic emission. But tympanometry is what we use primarily to assess the, the middle ear uh, system. The beginning of the 20th century, investigators started to reason that if there is any abnormalities in the middle ear transmission system, uh, it might be reflected as acoustical changes on the surface, the external surface or the lateral surface of the tympanic membrane. So they've started working on equipment to see how sound is affected as it travels through the middle ear system by measuring how sound is uh, in the external auditory canal. Um, earlier days, the equipment when they were more mechanical uh, used to take about 15 to 20 minutes to do this, um, to test each ear using a tympanometer. But now with advance in technology, uh, and kind of the miniaturization of microphones and loudspeakers um, and with the digitization of equipment, it takes almost less than a minute uh, with a cooperative uh, patient to do this testing. Um, so it's, it's a quick, it's non-invasive and it's an objective, reliable measure of the middle ear. Yeah. And as I said, now, uh, Almost routinely, tympanometry and other emittent tests, including acoustic reflexes, that is tested, um, is done for patients as a part of the routine, a uh, regular audiological evaluation. In a sense, what they what we do with an emittent uh, testing is we're measuring how effective the middle ear is transmitting sound um, through it. And uh, we're interpreting that that the good good transmission reaches the inner ear. Uh, other tests that are included in the emittance battery, which is, uh, for instance, acoustic reflex testing, not only assesses the middle ear system, but also provides an objective way of assessing the cochlea, the the facial and the eighth cranial nerve, the auditory nerve, so that's the seventh and the eighth cranial nerve, and also some structures in the lower brainstem. So it, it, it's a powerful um, and it's a reliable measure of all these structures. Some consider the emittance test battery to provide more information than the traditional measure that we use, namely the airborne gap that we can assess using pure tone audiometry. So if the results of the middle ear emittance subtest are within normal limits, some even consider that you might not have to do bone conduction testing uh, 
when we're doing pure tonal audiometry, and we're going to be talking about that, one of the tests that we do routinely is this bone conduction testing, where a bone vibrator is placed on the mastoid, as you can see in this uh, patient, and we give different tones uh, to assess what's the lowest level this person can hear if sounds are transmitted through the mastoid. Uh, and this is what we call as bone conduction testing. Um, so in pure tone audiometry, we assess the difference between hearing through air conduction when we use headphones and compare it to the levels that they hear through bone conduction uh, to kind of indirectly assess how well sound travels through the middle ear. Again, something that we're going to be talking about later uh, when we talk about pure audiometry. However, tympanometry assesses the middle ear system too, but it provides an objective way requiring, not requiring uh, an active response from the patient. Um, so it's a valuable diagnostic tool. It's simple, reliable, it's non-invasive, uh, uh, and a quick means of assessing the middle ear structures, including the ossicular chain, the station tube, of course, the tympan tympanic membrane, and importantly, how they work together. So in this test, what we're doing is uh, we are using a probe tone, uh, which is typically a low frequency tone. Uh, and in some ways, we are bouncing that sound on the surface of the tympanic membrane while we're changing air pressure um, in the ear canal. Since it's an objective and it's a quick test, it's, it's, uh, it's very valuable when we use it with young children and uncooperative adults. There are different kinds of uh, tympanometry. The one that we commonly use is known as vector tympanometry, where we use only a single uh, low-frequency probe tone, uh, which could be uh, it's, um, typically two, 220 hertz or 226 hertz, depending upon the manufacturer. Um, there's other types of tympanometry uh, that can be done as a part of our diagnostic evaluation, where they use number of frequencies um, um, known as multi-frequency tympanometry, are assessing a number of different components um, in multi-component tympanometry. But in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the simple, uh, the most commonly used vector tympanometer. So this is an example of, um, uh, these are examples actually, both of a portable tympanometers um, that are commonly seen in audiology clinics. They would have a base equipment in most cases and uh, a probe uh, tip. And the probe tip, at the end of the probe tip, uh, we have an option of fitting different probe um, uh, sizes, different probe tip sizes, uh, depending upon the size of the ear canal. One of the requirements to do tympanometry is uh, the need to get an airtight seal within the ear canal. Uh, so the probe um, device is fit with an appropriately sized tip in the ear canal uh, while uh, while the examiner is trying to pull the ear up and back, in the case of adults, to straighten the ear canal. Um, and once we get an airtight seal, uh, the test, as I said, takes only, um, it takes less than a minute, where essentially sound is being transmitted into the ear canal uh, while the pressure is being swept from uh, from a high positive, typically, to a high negative pressure. And in a sense, the equipment measures how much of the sound is being reflected back and giving us an indirect measure of how well sound is being transmitted through the tympanic membrane into the middle ear system. So the probe unit has a number of components, a parts. Uh, so it's got a pressure manometer and a pump. Uh, manometer is a device that measures pressure uh, changes. And the pump fluctuates or changes the pressure from a high positive to a high negative. And this pressure can be measured, uh, it's typically measured in decapascals. Um, but it's also measured in terms of millimeter um, um, 
water. Okay. So the pressure is changed um, as a probe tone uh, kind of sends a low frequency uh, signal into the ear canal. And then we have a microphone that measures how much of the sound is being reflected back uh, by the tympanic membrane. So, so all these components are there within that handheld probe unit uh, that the examiner uh, holds and, and uses uh, and fits with a probe tip to place it in the ear canal. So tympanometry is done after uh, an appropriate otoscopical examination to rule out any obvious and um, uh, acute external ear or middle ear condition, uh, such as uh, perforation or if there's any active discharge or if there's any inflammation in the ear canal. Um, if those conditions are present, there, it means that there's an obvious uh, condition that needs medical attention. So typically, you wouldn't even do uh, uh, the tympanometry and you would make an immediate referral to an ENT or the primary physician to take care of that medical condition. Um, but in case if you don't see any active uh, condition, then you proceed to do this tympanometry procedure. So you gotta, you're going to start by informing the patient of what, what this test is about and um, what he needs to do while you're doing this testing. Um, so you'll inform them that this tympanometry is a quick way of assessing how well the eardrum and the middle ear um, transmit sound and um, are, how well they work. You're going to tell them to hold still uh, for a few minutes and let you know if they have any uh, discomfort while you're doing this procedure. You'll tell them that um, they'll be hearing a low frequency tone and um, and they might feel a small pressure change. Typically, I'll tell them it, it's similar to when you're going up and uh, down a hill or coming down on a, on a plane. Um, you'll tell them that they're not required to respond. Um, all they have to do is just hold still and not talk or chew gum uh, while this test is being done. So what you're doing is you're essentially you're you're transmitting a sound um, into the ear canal, and you're measuring how much of the sound bounces back. So by introducing this known amount of sound energy um, and measuring how much energy is being reflected back, you you're getting a measure of how much of this energy actually goes through the middle ear system. So the amount of energy transmitted into the middle ear is going to, and that is what we call as admittance, equals the amount of energy that's introduced minus the amount of energy that returns back to the probe microphone. So, and by testing a number of normal middle ear systems, we know how much we expect to see reflected back. And so if more of the energy is being reflected back, that that kind of tells us that less of that energy is actually going through the middle ear system. Um, and we do that while we sweep the pressure um, from a positive 200 decapascals, so it's a high positive pressure, um, to a negative, high negative pressure, typically minus 400 decapascals. So here I have a link, and again, just a reminder that these links would not work in this narrated lecture. Uh, you would have to open them in a presentation view on the original PowerPoint, on the PowerPoint. So have it run in the presentation view and click on that. That should take you to this website, which has actually great information and animations about how what tympanometry is and um, how uh, how you, what, what's the physics behind um, this test procedure. So using that probe, you're actually passing uh, sound. Um, that's that low frequency 220 hertz probe tone of a certain amplitude. And typically, that's 85 dB SPL. And 
the probe measures how much of the sound is being reflected back okay giving us an idea of how much how much of energy is transmitted into the middle ear now with it, uh, a normal or healthy middle ear system and an healthy station tube the pressure inside the middle ear should be the same as that of the external ear or very close to what's there in the external ear now the pressure of the external ear air pressure in the external ear should be close to the environmental air pressure so the environmental air pressure is what it, um, is typically about 100 kilopascals or zero decapascals now the tympanic membrane in the middle ear is most efficient in vibrating uh, when the pressure is the same on both sides uh, namely the external ear and the middle ear in other words the system is more efficient in transmitting sound through it if the pressure um, is zero decapascals inside the middle ear um, as it is outside in the external auditory canal okay so now when you're changing the pressure uh, artificially through this probe system when the pressure inside and outside matches the zero decapascals that's when the energy transmitted in the middle ear is going to be the maximum uh, so in this case then amount of energy that's transmitting into the middle ear is what we call as admittance so the admittance is going to be maximum uh, when the pressure inside and outside equates around zero decapascals in um, in a healthy middle ear system but this equipment also checks the admittance uh, at a high positive pressure and a high negative pressure while simultaneously it's measuring at the admittance um, and these are what we call as the skirts uh, the ends of the, the this plot which we call as a tympanogram okay so we expect the admittance to be the lowest uh, admittance to be the lowest when there's a high positive pressure and when there's a high negative pressure but somewhere in between and if this is a normal middle ear system and normally station tube you expect maximum compliance and as I said uh, for a normal air pressure and normal middle ear system that should be around zero decapascals okay. the opposite of admittance is what we call as impedance impedance refers to the position of energy okay um, so the impedance is just the reciprocal of admittance so the impedance is is high uh, at those positive high positive and high negative pressures while the impedance is low um, when we are close to the zero decapascals so when you're creating this high positive pressure inside the external auditory canal essentially you're you're pushing the tympanic membrane inwards uh, and what that does is that stiffens the tympanic membrane on the other hand if you're creating this high negative pressure inside the auditory canal you're actually pulling out the tympanic membrane it's almost like sucking air out um, um, of the ear canal when you're creating this negative pressure and when you're creating this positive pressure it's almost like somebody's puffing air inside your ear canal um, either way it stiffens this tympanic membrane uh, and when the tympanic membrane is stiff that essentially what that does is well it reduces the amount of sound going inside the middle ear uh, another way of saying that is if you were to bounce a sound off a stiff tympanic membrane more of the sound is going to be reflected back okay so non-invasively what you're doing is you're bouncing sound back and if you see more of the sound energy being reflected back you indirectly interpreting that as a stiff uh, middle ear system or a stiff tympanic membrane and that's what you're doing uh, you, what are you doing with tympanometry yeah. so you, you're indirectly assessing how efficient the tympanic membrane is in transmitting sound through the middle ear by assessing how much of the sound is being reflected back 
if more sound is being reflected back, that means you are dealing with a stiff tympanic membrane. And the stiff tympanic membrane could be either because of a high positive pressure, high positive pressure or a high negative pressure in this case. So maximum sound transmission occurs when the air pressure is the same on both sides of the tympanic membrane. And say so that's typically around zero decapascals or 100 kilopascals. Or if you were to measure that in millimeter uh, mercury, that's around 760 millimeter mercury. Okay. So when you when you artificially change the pressure into a high positive and high negative, uh, less of the sound is going to be transmitted through the middle ear system. More is going to be reflected back, and that's what's depicted at the tails of your tympanic ram. So essentially, tympanometry is a way of assessing how efficient energy is flowing through the outer ear and the middle ear. And the results of that, when we plot that as a tympanogram, uh, so a tympanogram is a graphical representation of change in admittance. Um, the sign that we use to denote admittance is Y, um, and that's plotted in the vertical axis or the Y axis as you change the air pressure, um, and that's denoted by your horizontal axis or the x-axis. So a normal tympanogram looks like this. So here on the y-axis, you're measuring admittance or compliance, another term for admittance, while you're changing the air pressure on your x-axis. And typically, most equipment sweep the air pressure from like a high positive uh, towards a high negative. And again, if this is a normal, healthy middle ear system and eustachian tube, uh, the pressure where you're seeing maximum compliance is going to be close to this atmospheric pressure, which is zero decapascals. So you expect to see a peak uh, somewhere close to this zero decapascals. While in the other ends, uh, with the high positive and high negative pressures, you expect to see minimal compliance or almost zero compliance because of a stiffened tympanic membrane. So here, when you're seeing reduced admittance at the tails of the tympanogram, um, and typically you'll see that in a normal um, system around that plus 200 decapascals and this minus 200 decapascals, that means that more sound is being reflected back and you're measuring um, high SPL with your probe tone. Okay, more of the sound has been reflected back. And you expect to see an increased admittance. Uh, um, and the middle ear system is most efficient around that zero decapascals, which is our environmental air pressure. Now, if there is a middle ear condition that affects the transmission of sound, uh, it kind of results in a predictable fashion uh, by changing the shape of those tympanograms. Okay. So if you have a condition that results in um, stiffening the middle ear, it's going to result in low admittance measurements. So examples of that would be like when there uh, is otitis media, which refers to a condition where there's fluid inside the middle ear. Uh, that's going to result in the tympanic membrane bulging out and stiffening the tympanic membrane. Uh, on the other hand, if you see a lot of energy being uh, reflected back, I'm um, sorry, transmitted through the middle ear system, so less energy is being reflected back and measured through the probe tone, uh, that means that we have a highly mobile or a flaccid system, okay, an abnormally flaccid system, I should add. Uh, and that could be because of a condition like um, a fractured or, or discontinuous ossicular chain over here. So this could happen, for instance, if there was trauma to the head, uh, like such as an automobile accident or a blow to the head, that could result in the zoosicles being um, discontinuous or in some cases fractured. So they're not connected to the, the tympanic membrane um, 
correctly. So that results in the tympanic membrane being highly flaccid, you know, highly mobile. Um, so in those cases, it seems like more energy is going through the tympanic membrane, although it actually doesn't reach the inner ear because this chain is being discontinued. So when you're doing tympanometry, that's going to show up as a highly flaccid or a high admittance tympanogram, again giving us an idea of what the pathology is. So tympanometry not only assesses whether the system is normal or abnormal, the middle system is normal or abnormal, but it also can help us doing differential diagnosis. In other words, you'll be able to tell the etiology, uh, what is this middle ear condition? And that's valuable information for, uh, let's say, for the medical management of this condition. The surgeon, uh, the, uh, the medical practitioner can use that information in, um, in diagnosing what this middle ear condition is and then hence giving appropriate treatment. So not only the shape of the tympanogram is important, but we also get uh, like four important measures uh, that can help us determine the nature of the pathology affecting the, the uh, this middle ear transmission. So, so these measures are static acoustic admittance, ear canal volume, gradient or tympanometric gradient or width, uh, and tympanometric peak pressure. So the first measure, static acoustic admittance, is an estimate of the admittance of the lateral surface or the external surface of the tympanic membrane uh, without the effects of the external auditory canal. Essentially, the static acoustic admittance is a measure of the height of your tympanic rim. Uh, and, the sim and the symbol that we use to represent static acoustic admittance is at YTM. Okay. And the static acoustic admittance gives us an, a very important uh, measure of um, uh, that can help us determine what kind of middle ear condition, if it's abnormal. There's a number of variables or factors that affect static acoustic admittance. Women in general have a lower uh, static acoustic admittance, um, as do children um, when comparing to adults. So and the, in norms, um, for adults, we expect the static acoustic admittance to be from, um, from 0.3 uh, to 1.7 uh, millimole or ml the units that we use to represent static acoustic admittance. Uh, more over here is actually just the opposite of Holmes, OHM, which we use, the unit that we use to measure resistance. So here we are measuring admittance, which is the opposite of resistance. So the unit they use is more, in this case, millimole, small amounts of mole. Uh, for children, uh, younger than 10 years, we expect that to be uh, from 0.25 to 1.05 millimole. And then infants and toddlers, uh, the range is from 0.2 to 0.7 millimole. Okay. Some tympanometers might, re uh, might report static acoustic emittance in terms of milliliter or even centimeter cube instead of millimole. And so that's something that we need to be aware of when you're using different types of tympanometers. Okay, so what are abnormal values of static acoustic admittance? If it's reduced uh, when compared to the norms, that means that less energy is flowing into the middle ear system. So indirectly telling us that something is making the middle ear system stiff. Uh, conditions that might result in, uh, in doing that could be like otitis media, the common uh, middle ear infection, are like otosclerosis. Otosclerosis refers to uh, a condition that might run in families where actually there's a bony growth uh, on the stapes, kind of fixating the stapes to the oval window, and making the ossicular chain stiff. Uh, so when you were, in some cases of otosclerosis, what you would see is a reduced peak of the tympanogram and reduced static acoustic admittance values. Okay. On the other hand, you might some conditions might result in an increased uh, static acoustic admittance, 
uh, that would tell us that there's an abnormal amount of energy flowing into the tympanic uh, through the tympanic membrane into the middle ear system uh, that could be because of conditions like debris um, like bugs stuck on the tympanic membrane um, it could be because of external otitis where this kind of inflammation of the tympanic membrane or the as i mentioned earlier it could be because of a disruption in the ossicular chain um, so if the ossicular chain are not connected correctly giving that kind of normal tension in the tympanic membrane uh, it might result in the tympanic membrane being more kind of wobbly or more lax uh, so that might actually result in seemingly more energy going through the tympanic membrane Another con common condition that may result in a uh, hyperflaccid uh, or in an increased uh, static acoustic admittance value is like a scarred tympanic membrane. Um, the scar tissue uh, that might develop on the tympanic membrane after, let's say, a perforation uh, usually is um, thinner uh, than the regular membrane, tympanic membrane, so making the tympanic membrane more mobile than it should be. So these are examples of tympanograms with low admittance. Uh, and so the low admittance is measured in this case, in this example, as a peak. Uh, so this is an adult with 0.2 centimeter cube, which is less than uh, the 0.3, which is the norms. And this is actually a case where with a flat tympanogram, um, this could be a case where um, there's a perforation in the tympanic membrane. Um, and the reason why I say that is you're seeing an abnormally high volume, ear canal volume, uh, something that we're going to be talking about in a bit. So you can see that uh, if with low static acoustic admittance values, you also see like a shallower or, or a flat tympanogram. The other case, you might see a very tall, um, abnormally tall tympanogram. And that usually is associated with a high static acoustic admittance value. So in this case, it's about 1.8 centimeter cube. One well, of the norms for adults is um, the high value for within the norms is 1.7 centimeter cube. Um, so this would be uh, a case of high admittance, and abnormally high admittance tympanogram. So this. The static acoustic admittance is a kind of a measure of the height of the tympanogram. So we expect a normal range, um, a normal height of the tympanogram. So, but if there's an abnormal middle ear system, uh, it could either make the middle ear system stiff, so resulting in a low static acoustic admittance, or it could make it too tall, uh, to kind of representing a hyperflaccid middle ear system. Another important tympanometric measure is this tympanometric width or gradient. So it's a measure of how broad the tympanogram is. Um, it's also it's measured in decapascals, and it's essentially the breadth of the tympanogram at half of its height, um, so half from its peak. So if the tympanogram uh, tympanogram is shallow, uh, it's going to also have a high gradient value. The other hand, if the tympanogram is kind of um, kind of narrow and tall, then you're going to have a low gradient value. So in children, you expect the gradient measure to be between 80 and 159 decapascals, while in adults, um, it's around 51 to 114 decapascals. And again, this is one of the measures that's reported when you uh, when you're doing this procedure and in your printout. So conditions that result in abnormal tympanometric width uh, could include like otitis media, where there's a fluid inside the, the middle ear space. So what that's going to do is going to result in a shallower uh, tympanogram, and it's going to result in a, a higher than normal uh, gradient value. Another condition that might result in the, uh, a higher tympanometric width is tympanosclerosis. Tympanosclerosis is uh, a condition that we're going to be talking about when we talk about the disorders of the ear. 
The third tympanometric measure uh, is ear canal volume, or equivalent ear canal volume, ECV. So this is an estimate of the volume between the probe tip, the end of the probe tip that you place inside the ear canal, and the tympanic membrane. Okay. Uh, so in, in the presence of a flat tympanogram, uh, which has low static acoustic admittance value, uh, the, this ear canal volume can give us a um, useful information of whether their eardrum is actually perforated uh, or not. For instance, if there is a perforation in the tympanic membrane, then actually you're not measuring only the ear canal volume, but you're also including the middle ear space. So you expect to see a large ear canal volume reported by your uh, reported in the tympanogram. And based on testing a number of normal adults and children, we have a range that we expect to see this normal ear canal volume. So if it's abnormally large, um, and, and when you see a flat tympanogram, that means that there's a perforation of the tympanic membrane, um, and, it's, uh, and so you're measuring both the ear canal volume and the middle ear space. On the other hand, you might see a flat tympanogram and a normal ear canal volume. Uh, so that might indicate that the tympanic membrane is actually intact, but it's stiff. It's abnormally high, um, it has abnormally high stiffness. And that could be because of a lot of fluid behind the middle ear space, behind the tympanic membrane, uh, resulting in this very stiff tympanic membrane. Uh, but since there's no perforation yet, you know, in many cases, if, this, if there's a lot of fluid and long-standing ear infection, that's when you see a perforation of the eardrum. Um, so that's also valuable information. Okay. Um, the ear canal volume also can tell you about uh, the patency, or uh, whether the tubes that, that some children have is open. Okay. So they're known as the pressure equalization tubes or tympanostomy tubes. These are small tubes that are placed in the tympanic membrane uh, in cases of long-standing ear infections uh, in children, typically. Um, so when you're doing this tympanometric procedure, uh, if you see a large ear canal volume with a flat tympanogram, so in these cases, uh, it tells us that actually the tube is open and, and, and it's doing its job. So the ear canal volume can range from abnormally high and also can be abnormally small. Okay, abnormally small would be in cases where there's actually some volume occupying lesion within the ear canal. So if something is lying between the tympanic membrane and the probe tip, reducing the ear canal volume. And that could be like a foreign body. It could be a piece of an eraser or a bead. In, in some children's ear canal. It could be a tumor. Um, or it could be just a lot of cerumen in some cases. Um, cerumen or wax, excessively large amount of wax. So in adults, you expect the ear canal volume to be between 0.9 to 2.0 centimeter cube. Um, centimeter cube is a unit that we use to measure uh, report ear canal volume. In children, uh, you expect that to be smaller because they have smaller ear canals. Uh, the range is between 0.3 to 1.0 centimeter cube. Now, if they have tubes, uh, those pressure equalization tubes, you you are you will expect to see a large ear canal volume, and that's what is considered normal. Um, so, when you're assessing these children to see whether the speed tubes are patent, uh, if it's open and um, to do its job. You expect to see this large ear canal volume, and that would not be considered abnormal. That would be considered actually uh, what we expect to see, uh, normal. So if you might see an excessive large ear canal volume if you're having a tympanometric perforation. So this is an example of a TM perforation. Uh, so in those cases, if you, if you don't readily see it in otoscopy, uh, when you're doing this tympanometric procedure, you actually can um, uh, kind of confirm that perforation by when you see a large ear canal volume. 
In other cases, you might see uh, also a large ear canal volume when uh, this child, if there was a child with a tube placed. Uh, so if you see a large ear canal volume, that means that the tube is open uh, as it should be to do an efficient job. Um, in many cases, you might uh, see children actually known to have tubes. Um, and when you look at, when you're doing a toscopy, it might seem like the tube is close to the eardrum at least. Uh, but when you're doing uh, tympanometry, you might see that the ear canal volume is kind of normal or what you expect to see uh, for children, uh, but so that will tell you that the tubes are actually not inside the, uh, not on the tympanic membrane, and they're not are they're not open, and that's valuable information for follow up of that child too. Okay, so you also might see a reduced ear canal volume. Uh, that would mean that there's some mass occupying lesion in the external auditory canal. So that could be like a foreign body in the ear canal, or it could be a tumor um, growing in the external artery canal, so reducing the volume of the, the ear canal volume. So in the presence of a flat tympanogram, or normal or near normal ear canal volume, um, that means that the tympanic membrane is excessively stiff, and, and in many cases that's because of like fluid. Um, in the middle ear space. And often that will concur with your otoscopic uh, examination, which is like a reddening or inflammation of the tympanic membrane. Um, and in some cases, you might even see like bubbles, air bubbles or water bubbles, I'm sorry, um, on the surface of the tympanic membrane. The fourth uh, tympanometric measure is the tympanometric peak pressure. Okay. Essentially, it's the pressure and which where you're seeing the peak of the tympanogram. And ideally, uh, the tympanometric peak pressure is going to be close to zero decapascals uh, in a healthy middle ear eustachian tube system. And so the, you might see a range, and the, typically the range is between plus 50 and minus 50 decapascals. Okay. Um, although it, it provides us um, information about the middle ear system, especially the eustachian tube. Um, often the tympanometric peak pressure is not used as a sole um, measure to make an ENT referral. The reason behind that is it might result in over-referral. Um, so if, if the volume is with the normal limits and the static acoustic admittance is with the normal limits, just an abnormal tympanometric peak pressure uh, might be not enough to make a immediate referral, medical referral, because especially in children, because you many children have a transient middle ear infection or East Asian dysfunction that might result in a negative, abnormally negative peak pressure. And um, if you were to send them all of these children to um, back to the ENT or their pediatrician, that might just result in over referral usually will indicate that to the to the parent and um, tell them to be um, observing the child and if any symptoms arise such as fever um, or if the child reports of earache then to take them to the medical practitioner uh, so because that might be an indication of a progression of the condition so an abnormally negative tympanometric peak pressure is associated with the, an eustachian tube abnormality. Um, so in, in a normal middle ear system, it's the job of the eustachian tube to maintain the pressure inside the middle ear the same as that of the, uh, the external ear canal and, and outside. So if you're seeing an abnormal peak pressure, that means that the eustachian tube is not doing its job right. Uh, like if you have like otitis media, uh, a common middle ear infection, uh, you typically you'd also see a significant uh, negative peak pressure. And so in other words, the peak pressure might be more than minus 100 decapascals. You might also see a negative peak pressure in other eustachian tube pathologies, like um, if the eustachian tubes are closed uh, because of an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, are because of inflamed tonsils or adenoids, kind of closing 
the opening of the eustachian tube uh, at the level of the nasopharynx. So those are the conditions that might actually result in uh, a negative peak pressure because of an abnormal eustachian tube. So here's an example of a tympanogram with an abnormal negative peak pressure. So here you're seeing the peak pressure over here. So in this case, it's minus 245 decapascals. So it's abnormally high. Uh, and you can see that the tympanogram is shifted in the negative um, side, negative pressure side. So in other words, what it essentially tells us that, it tells that that you need to artificially have a negative pressure in the ear canal to equate the negative pressure within the middle ear space to, to have maximum compliance. So again, remember, maximum compliance is when the pressure is the same on both sides. Now in this case, the pressure needs to be negative to equate the middle ear pressure uh, to enable this high admittance. Okay. So if you're having a blocked eustachian tube, um, that's when you're building up a high negative pressure within the middle ear space. So if the eustachian tube does not uh, periodically vent the middle ear space, what's going to happen is because of the mucus lining within the middle ear space, you're gonna, uh, it's gonna result in this negative pressure. You probably might have noticed that uh, when you're going up, like up a hill, uh, what's happening to your soda bottle? Uh, if it's a plastic soda bottle, you'd see that it's kind of uh, squished inside. Uh, that's because it, there's a negative pressure that's being created within the uh, soda bottle. So imagine just like that. So um, if there's this negative pressure within the middle of space, the tympanic membrane is kind of it's going to be sucked in, uh, and making the tympanic membrane stiff, but also uh, resulting in this negative shift in the tympanogram. Other conditions that might result in this negative peak pressure could be like an inflamed tonsils or adenoids kind of blocking the eustachian tube, um, so resulting in this eustachian tube dysfunction. So tympanometry. It's a valuable diagnostic tool for assessing the middle ear stratus. We use different diagnostic measures. Uh, important, the important ones are static acoustic admittance, tympanometric width, and ear canal volume. And uh, this link should take you to uh, some examples of abnormal tympanograms, and I urge you guys to review those.